Part two of this video focuses on preparing your data and the accompanying documentation for sharing. This part of the video will cover best practices for preparing your data for sharing, including details you should consider when creating variables, considerations for sharing derivative or constructed data sets, how to best organize your data files, and what information should be shared about the study itself. How to handle data that contains sensitive or identifying information will also be discussed. The main idea to keep in mind when you are preparing your data for sharing is that a well-prepared data collection contains information intended to be complete and self-explanatory for future users. When preparing your data, it can be helpful to consider a secondary user's perspective by asking yourself the question, how should I organize the data so that secondary users can independently understand the data collection? Part one of the video outlined what are considered scientific data that need to be shared and elements of the research process that do not need to be shared. As a reminder, the elements that should be included in a data deposit to a repository include the files that contain the data, accompanying documentation that explains the data, like the codebook or user guide, and documents that describe the study and the data, or what is known as metadata. Early in the research process, even before you collect data, you should think about how to organize your data to make them understandable by secondary users. The recommendations for organizing your data in the next several slides are not only helpful when it comes to sharing your data with others, but these are also general best practices for data organization even for yourself and other members of the research team. When you think through the organization of your data, it can be helpful to think about data at three different levels. The variable level, the file level, and the study level. We will discuss each of these levels in the following slides, but it is important to note that the precise organization of your data collection will be driven by the nature of your specific data and research. Let's start with the first level of your data collection, the variable level. There are several variable level elements to think through prior to collecting data, including naming conventions, variable and value labels, missing data, and variable level documentation. Each of these will be discussed in the following slides. Importantly, at this level of the data, there are some differences between statistical and non-statistical data, which we will point out along the way. By statistical data, we mean any data that are numerical. Statistical data are most commonly arranged in tabular form with rows and columns. By non-statistical data, we mean any data that are not numerical. These may include text data, images, audio, or video. At the start of your project, something you will want to consider is the variable naming convention that you will use throughout your data collection. This is true of both statistical data and text data. Here are some common naming conventions. The first is one-up numbering, like v1 for the first variable, v2 for the second, and so on. These are simple, but they do not really convey any information or content about the data contained in each variable. A similar convention is using question numbers. For example, Q1 corresponds to the first question on your survey, and so on. Again, this is simple to do, but has the same issue as the one-up numbers. Additionally, you may have multiple variables corresponding to the same survey question if there are multiple parts to the question. You may end up with Q1A, Q1B, and so on, which could get confusing. This can also be problematic if you have data from several different questionnaires, and each questionnaire has questions with the same number.
In this case, you would need to add yet another identifier to the variable name to differentiate between the various questionnaires, which again can get confusing, especially for secondary users who are not as familiar with the questionnaires as you might be. Another option is to use mnemonic names, or something that corresponds to or describes the variable directly. This can be a good approach, but keep in mind that names that make sense to you may or may not make sense to other users, so you will want to be careful with the names you choose. The last common convention is prefix, root, or suffix systems. This is common with more complex datasets. For example, multi-wave or multi-level data collections may use this type of naming convention. You might have data collected from both parents, and you may develop a naming schema such that the letter or number in the first position indicates whether the variable comes from the mother or father. The letter or number in the second position might indicate the wave in which the variable was collected, and so on. If using this method, it is important to document to what each part of the variable name refers. These are just some examples of naming conventions. There are several others that you may choose to use, but regardless of the exact method you choose, it is important that you remain consistent and apply the same naming convention throughout your entire dataset. In addition to the naming of the variables, Labeling the variables is also important for both statistical and text data. There are three pieces of information that are helpful to include in variable labels. First, if the variable corresponds directly to a survey or questionnaire item, include the question or item number to which the variable corresponds. Second, you should always include a clear description of the variable's content. Finally, it is helpful to indicate whether the variable is an original variable or a variable that has been derived or constructed by the research team through recoding or scaling of other variables. For example, your survey may ask a series of five questions related to the respondent's health. You may want to sum the responses from these five questions to create a health index. You will want to indicate that this health index variable was constructed from other variables and not asked directly on the survey. An easy way to indicate that a variable has been constructed from other variables in the dataset is to include underscore C at the end of whatever name you choose for the constructed variable. You can see here in the first example for an original variable the variable name is our health, and the variable label contains both the corresponding question number in the survey, as well as a complete description of the data contained in this variable. In the second example, you can easily identify that the variable was constructed because the variable name includes underscore C at the end. The variable label then describes the content of that variable which includes a clear indication that the variable was constructed. Again, you can choose other ways to indicate this, but whatever you choose should be documented somewhere and should be consistent throughout your data files. You should also document exactly how the variable was constructed. For example, what variables did you sum together to get this constructed variable? In addition to the variable labels, value labels are also important. Variable labels describe the data contained in each variable, while value labels describe all the response choices for each variable and what they represent. Unless you are grouping text data into different categories and assigning a code to each category, value labels will typically only be necessary for statistical data. Value labels should be mutually exclusive, exhaustive, and precisely defined.
Here is an example of what value labels look like for a variable that captures the respondent's employment status. You can see each of the three options that respondents could choose from has its own label and corresponds to how it is coded in the data. So if an individual sees a 1 for this variable, that means the respondent is unemployed. It is important that every possible response option has its own unique code and label. Something that the values for the employment variable in the previous slide did not capture is an instance where there might not be data for that variable for a particular respondent. When developing your coding scheme and value labels, it is important to consider whether there will be missing data and how these will be labeled. Researchers are encouraged to standardize missing data and to differentiate between the different types of missing data. A variable might have missing data for a number of reasons. For example, the question might be inapplicable to a respondent. The respondent may not know the answer to the question, or the respondent may refuse to answer the question. Even if the differences between various types of missing data are not important to you, a secondary user might be interested in using this information in their analysis. You can see in the example here that each type of missing data has its own unique value. It can be helpful to code missing data in a slightly different way than non-missing data. For example, by having two or three of the same digit in a row. This helps to easily identify missing data and reduces mistaking missing data for real data. However you choose to code your missing data, it is important to remain consistent throughout your data set. It is also important to note that if don't know or inapplicable is a response option given to participants along with other response options, this can be coded on the same scale as the other choices and does not necessarily need to be declared as missing data like in the example here. No matter the data type, documentation is very important to include in what you submit to a repository to be shared. Documentation refers to any files with information that explains the data and the data collection processes to help secondary users independently understand the data. The most common types of documents that are shared along with the data include codebooks or data dictionaries, which are documents that describe what the variables are and how they are organized, and contain the variable names, variable labels, and value labels, a user guide that instructs secondary users how to use the data, and the original data collection instruments or questionnaires that include the complete text given to study participants, if applicable. Generally, this information is submitted in Word or PDF format, but most repositories accept several other file types. The more thoroughly documented your data are, the easier it will be for secondary users to understand your data and use them appropriately. Now let's consider an instance where you have constructed or derived data from a data set that was collected by other researchers. For example, you may have combined several data points from different researchers to produce a data set that is appropriate for your study. Or you may have created several new index variables from variables in an existing data set. What should you share and what are you allowed to share in these instances? First, recall that under the ACL Public Access Plan, you are required to share any scientific data that results from your study. This means that any variables that you constructed or derived from other data must be shared. Whether you can share the original data set from which your constructed variables came, along with your data, depends on the level of access to the original data set. Before sharing any data from a data set that was collected by another researcher or organization, you will want to ensure that you have the rights to redistribute the original data. 
This is typically not a problem if the original data are unrestricted use or public access data, but you should verify with the original source of the data before sharing them. If the original data are restricted use data or proprietary data that you do not have the rights to redistribute, you will still need to deposit the data that you constructed or derived, as well as the source information about the original data. If this is the case, it is most helpful for secondary users if you also include the statistical code that you used in your statistical program to construct the new data, and a document that explains how you constructed the new data in non-statistical terms. This way, if secondary users are interested in doing something similar, they can obtain the original data from the original data source on their own. They can then match that data up with the information that you provide about your new constructed variables, or look at your statistical code to see what you did to recreate the derivative data set. Now let's move on to the file level structure of data. First, data and data files can come in a wide variety of formats and appearances. Again, with the nature of your data in mind, you will want to ask yourself what file structure will make the most sense for your data and for secondary users. There are several common file formats that can be accepted by repositories for sharing statistical data. It is easiest to share your data in a statistical package format like SPSS, SAS, or Stata files. ASCII text format with statistical setups is also acceptable and can easily be converted into other formats. Data in relational databases, Access, Excel, or text files that are comma delimited or tab delimited are also acceptable. For non-statistical files, there are some formats that are easy to share and are more readily convertible to other formats. There is always some risk that a format may become obsolete over time as technology advances. This is particularly true for proprietary file formats. Repositories like ICPSR often differentiate formats that they can fully support from those that they cannot guarantee over time. The formats listed on this slide are generally the easiest to share. Since technology advances quickly, it is a good idea to contact your repository before collecting data to discuss any changes in recommended formats that may have taken place recently in order to fully support access to the data over longer periods of time, especially if you are planning to collect non-statistical data. For image and video formats in particular, File size and storage needs may be important to consider depending on the scale of your data collection. Again, you should consult with your repository before collecting data to ensure it can handle video and audio files at the scale your data will demand. How you arrange your files can also affect how understandable your data collection is. There are several ways to organize your files. Again, this will largely depend on the nature of your data. The information in this slide is relevant for both statistical and non-statistical data files. However, there are some special considerations for non-statistical data files, which will be discussed in the next slide. You might have one large data file that contains all of your variables in one place, you may have one large file that separates your data into different sections, like using different sheets within an Excel file. You may also have several separate files that each contain a different type of data. You may put different data files in different folders, or you could nest folders within other folders, or arrange them hierarchically, if that makes sense for your data. Any of these formats are acceptable, but the more complex the file structure is, the more information you will have to provide to secondary users about how to navigate your file or folder structure. This can be done in a separate Word document that also gets shared alongside your data files.
Unlike statistical data, where you might have hundreds of data points in one spreadsheet or file, data points in formats such as video or image are often represented by an entire file. One of the best ways to ensure your data are easy to use by secondary users is to organize and label your files. For smaller studies with 40 to 50 files or less, it is sufficient to select descriptive file names that help the user understand how the files are organized and includes any descriptive information about the file that is easy to convey. For example, female underscore one, female underscore two, and so on. For larger studies, you should also consider using well-labeled folders and subfolders to group similar files together and make it easier for a user to navigate and find what they are looking for. The best practice is to include a document called a data listing that lists all the files and indicates various characteristics associated with each file. For example, all of the image files in a study may be listed in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, and the columns can be used to indicate various demographic characteristics or treatment conditions for each image file. This kind of data listing can help users more easily identify a subset of files with relevant characteristics. For example, male participants at first interview who were age 45 and older. Finally, let's turn to discussing the study level information that you should prepare to share along with your data. Study level metadata is equally important and works in the same way for all data, regardless of format. When we talk about study level metadata, we mean study descriptions that explain the study purpose, collection methods, sample, and other information that enable the secondary user to help understand why the data were collected. The study level metadata should focus on the broader study and the data collection efforts. So in that regard, it is not the same thing as a publication abstract. When thinking about what information you should have ready to share about your study, it is helpful to think about the common W questions. Who is involved in the study? This includes the principal investigators and other members of the research team, the participants of the study, and the funding organization of your project. What is the study about? You should prepare a summary of the study that describes what you did throughout the project. Where did the study and or data collection take place? When was the study conducted? or when were the data collected? To what time period do the data refer? Why were the data collected? Describe the purpose, goals, and scope or aims of the study. And finally, how did you collect the data? What design or methodology did you use? What was your sample and how was it chosen? Did you use any weighting techniques? And if so, what steps do secondary users need to take to apply the same weights? You should have all of this information, as well as any additional information that you think would help others understand and use your data, in a separate document to share along with your data. Now that we have discussed setting up the structure of your data to enable data sharing, you may be concerned about how to share your data appropriately. You may be collecting health or educational data that are protected under federal statutes or laws, and you may be concerned about protecting the identity of your study's participants. It is good to be concerned about these things and to think about how protecting participants fits in with data sharing. When a data record contains information about an individual that can potentially identify them, we call this a disclosure risk. Some examples of data that have the potential to identify participants include detailed data on geography, exact birth date or other exact dates, exact occupations held, or a combination of several variables that secondary users may be able to use together to identify study participants.
there are two types of identifying data, direct and indirect. Direct identifiers are variables that point explicitly to particular individuals or units. They may have been collected in the process of survey administration and are usually easily recognized. Some examples of direct identifiers include participants' names, photos or videos of participants, their addresses and phone numbers, social security numbers, or other unique numbers that are linked with an individual, like driver's license numbers or employee ID numbers. Indirect identifiers are not necessarily problematic on their own, but when combined with other variables, may reveal the identity of study participants. For instance, a United States zip code field may not be troublesome on its own, but when combined with other attributes like race and annual income, a zip code may identify unique individuals within that zip code, which means the answers the participant thought would be private are no longer private. Other examples of indirect identifiers include information on employment or social organization membership, educational histories that include school names and or years of attendance, and detailed income information. As the ACL Public Access Plan states, scientific data that must be shared only include de-identified data. This means that before sharing your data, you need to ensure that you have removed all identifying information from the data. If your data are regulated or protected by certain laws or statutes, like HIPAA for health-related data, or FERPA for education-related data, these laws might identify specific variables that are considered personally identifiable information. For example, HIPAA has determined 18 identifiers that must be removed in order for a dataset to be considered de-identified. This list includes several variables mentioned in the previous slides, including name, telephone number, and social security number, but also things like exact age if you have participants aged 89 years or older. A link to the NIH website that lists all 18 identifiers under HIPAA can be found in the references section below this video. If your data are protected by these types of laws, you should review them before sharing your data to ensure you understand what constitutes personally identifiable information. If your data include identifying information, there are various ways to de-identify your data set before sharing it. For statistical data with direct identifiers like names or social security numbers, you should remove the variable from the data set completely. For text data, this information should be completely redacted. For some identifying variables, however, you can recode the data. Age, for example, is only considered to be personally identifiable information if you have participants aged 89 years or older. You can recode your age variable so that all of the ages in your data set that are younger than 89 remain the same but then all of the ages 89 or older are grouped together and represented by one value. Other data types, such as video and image, can be very rich in context, and reducing disclosure risk may be more time-consuming and complex than it is for statistical data. For example, images and video typically cannot be de-identified without affecting their use. However, you can still share de-identified transcripts or coded data instead of the raw data.